Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow, EU, and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook Live video feed, the link to which I will now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Tonight, our featured guests are Kelly McGarry and Jesus Sines, both violinists and founders of Musicians for the World, Incorporated, who join us from New York City. Ms. McGarry and Mr. Sines are joined by several of their program's young music students, Valentin Ilares, who joins us from Lima, Peru, Zamariah Jones Blackman, who joins us from, from Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, Harold Suarez, who joins us from Chiquitos, Bolivia, Adam Atonia, Catherine Wairimu, and John Musila, who join us from Nairobi, Kenya. We are also joined by Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. Kelly, Jesus, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Hello, thank you, Simon. So, Kelly, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with Musicians for the World. Sure. Um, so, I am a violinist, originally from Long Island, New York. And um, I, I went through my conservatory training to be a performer. Um, at first, I started off as wanting to be a soloist and then a chamber musician, and then I wanted to play orchestrally. And now um, I am running a nonprofit and teaching. So um, I kind of went through every different step I could have gone through to get to where I am. Um, so Musicians for the World, we actually uh, got involved in it together. Uh, we are the founders, Jesus and I. And um, the two of us wound up um, making some connections. Jesus will get a little bit more into this when he introduces himself, but we had some connections with um, Peru and with Haiti um, and some music programs there. And at the start of the pandemic, they asked that we uh, help to teach their students. So we began doing that voluntarily. And after a while of doing it, we realized it was pretty doable to teach people from all across the world, as long as they have internet, which most people do these days. Um, so the two of us just decided to make something out of it. So we kind of just jumped right into it. Um, yeah, and here we are, we're teaching all these different places. We've expanded a lot. It's something that just kind of, uh, naturally happened to us. There wasn't like a big master plan for years. We just kind of jumped right in. Okay. Hey, Zeus, same question. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jesus Sainz. I am originally from Lima, Peru. I grew up in Lima. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I came to the United States. I went to school in Texas, in Boston, where Kelly and I met. And now we are in New York City. And I think Kelly explained it all. I, I just wanted to mention that before uh, the pandemic, Kelly and I were working in a cruise ship. We were playing chamber music recitals. And then the pandemic hit, we all became uh, unemployed. And we started to volunteer. We realized that we had a music program going on before we even named our nonprofit. And that's how uh, we started Musicians for the World. Today, we're teaching in uh, about nine countries including Kenya, uh, countries like Suriname, Belize, uh, Peru, Mexico, Haiti, and others, Bolivia as well. You should tell about 
how you knew the program. Yeah. Sure, yes. And three years ago, uh, I went to Haiti for a summer festival. I, I volunteered to teach and that's how we get, that's how we got the first connection with, with Haiti. And then Kelly and I uh, visited Peru a few times and we got to uh, meet students from Peru. And uh, that's, those two programs were the starting programs of Musicians for the World, Haiti and Peru. And then we started to expand from there. And so tell us a little bit about the, um, what is it that Musicians for the World does that no other music or educational institute does? I would say the biggest difference between us and other institutes is that um, we don't charge our students anything at all. Um, that would be definitely the number one difference. Um, all of our classes are free of charge and anyone from these programs can come and tune in to any of our classes. Um, but beyond uh, just that, um, a big difference between us and other programs is that we um, we're very international. So we have, like Jesus said, we have students from all different areas of the world. And to even take it a step further, uh, the programs that we're working with, many of them are in areas um, where there is not really a music education. Um, so we're kind of welcoming in uh, students who wouldn't normally have this opportunity. Um, and it's free of charge, all online. Um, yeah, is there anything you want to add? And yeah, I think uh, Kelly explained it very well. We also believe that music or music education can change lives, especially in vulnerable areas. Uh, the only difference is that uh, we do it online and because we do it online, we can do it in a global scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have uh, Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California has a question or comment. Lino, welcome back. Nice to see you. <laughs> yes, I'm still not home, but uh, I'm glad that I could join you. Kelly and Jesus, wonderful project that you have. I have a lot of questions, but let's just start with this. Do you teach only classical music to your students? And if so, um, how do you target those students in those other countries? Yeah, do you want to answer? Okay, um, so basically what we do, um, we do not force our students to uh, play classical music. Um, I've had students come to me with traditional Kenyan pieces, Haitian pieces, um, and you know, we're, we, there's never a point where we're forcing them to play Western music. Um, what we do is we incorporate like the technical aspects of Western music. So I'm classically trained and Jesus is classically trained. So, you know, in terms of holding the violins or the cello or whatever instrument may be, um, learning like the different techniques for making a good and beautiful sound. But when it comes to selecting repertoire, we really encourage our students to come to us with what they want unless there is a circumstance where they're asking us, what should I play? Um, but there's always kind of this open dialogue between us and our students, you know, they get to do what they want to do and we just help them along with that. Um, and actually, I mean, we just started this past May, um, but we have been expanding and we just welcomed a really awesome Indian violinist onto our team. Um, so she's starting to work with the students in Suriname where there's a huge Indian influence um, his use obviously has the Latin influence. Um, so eventually it is our goal to, you know, expand on everything. But um, for the time being, we're just, you know, doing the best with what we have and we're allowing our students to really do whatever we, they want musically. And then we add to it what, what we have to offer basically. Um, yeah. I hope okay. That Thank you. <laughs> yes, it, that answers my question. Uh, the other question is, how do you target the students? I mean, how do you find these students? Do you have a subgroup or of organization or people recruiting, let, having the PR for everybody so that your program will be known? How do you do it? So what we do is, first of all, is, is, it would be nice to uh, clarify, we partner with existing programs in these communities. 
Uh, so it's not just like random students just try to be part of us. Sometimes, uh, they sometimes are, there yeah. is a few occasions where they there is uh, students to where there is no music program in their community, but most of the students are part of some program. And it's it's been a combination of connections that we had and just programs finding us online and being like, hey, we really want to work with you. Uh, we have we are from the Amazon of Peru. We are from we just got a message from someone in Cyprus and yeah. Okay, I have some follow up questions because it's just very fascinating for me. Your project is really, really commendable. Um, the, the other thing that uh, is there an age bracket or an, an age requirement? Is there a technical proficiency in an instrument? Can somebody say, hey, uh, I heard of this instrument called violin. I have never seen one. Uh, can I come and join your program. I mean, is there a minimum proficiency level and what age group do you? Uh... Uh, absolutely not. We, we accept everyone who wants to learn music in our program. Um, yeah, there, I mean, really anyone can join even if they've never held a violin before. Um, we had a, we actually sent an instrument to someone because they didn't even have an instrument and she joined our classes. Um, anyone who wants to learn music, we we welcome them in. Okay, so this sounds like a good time to bring in our first uh, musician of the evening, Valentin Ilares from Lima, Peru. He has studied piano, violin, and composition through Musicians for the World Incorporated. And also his father and sister also take lessons with Musicians for the World. Hi, Valentin. Hola, Valentin, ¿cómo estás? Tu micrófono. Hola, estoy bien. It's good. Gracias. So, Valentin, can, can you play us a little bit of piano? ¿Puedes tocar un poquito de piano? Yes, yeah, sí. Okay, so Valentin, what uh, tell us about this music, this this composition of yours? Dino sobre tu composición, eh, el nombre y de qué se trata. Trata de, de muchos gatos y hace mucho gato, hace mucho tiempo, hace algunos años, su origen fue así. Mis abuelitos me trajeron un gatito de peluche al que le llamé super gatito porque le puse una capa de, de papel higiénico, pero actualmente ahora tiene una capita de tela. Okay, entonces, entonces poco a poco, poco a poco comencé a hacer sus historietas. Y, y después, más adelante, quise hacer una serie de televisión. So, uh, Valentin, movie and Valentin. Uh, Valentin uh, was inspired uh, about this composition because his grandfather gave him a, a little cat toy and he uh, put some toilet paper around the cat toy and started calling it the super cat. And now he wrote a, a comic uh, story, like he writes like kind of like comic book style uh, things, and he composed uh, this song based on the on the comic uh, that he's writing and drawing. Very nice, Valentin. And Professor Lino Rivera writes great, <laughs> and he's professor of piano, so he knows what he's he's talking about. So uh, my next question, Valentin, is. Is that a parrot on your shoulder? Te está preguntando si es un loro el que está en tu en tu hombro. Sí, es un lorito. Le gusta mucho comer choclo, estar volando y estar conmigo. 
<laughs> he likes a lot uh, eating uh, corn and uh, fly around the house and be being on his shoulder. Cuando está uh, feliz busca contacto físico. When he's uh, happy, he looks for physical contact. Valentin, so is the parent also taking piano lessons at the same time as you? Dice que si el loro también está en las clases de piano contigo. Sí, muchas veces he estado. <laughs> Many times he's there. Wonderful. So, Valentin, I believe you also have something to play for us on the violin. Esto nos está diciendo que te está preguntando si es que también tienes algo que tocar en el violín. Yes, sí, mi composición que me inspiré en mi lorito poli. Les puedo explicar un poco. Yeah, he has a composition uh, inspired on his pirates. Uh, he can explain a little bit more about it. Please. Explícanos a ver sobre la composición. Todas las mañanas, el lorito poli, mi, o sea, mi lorito, se sale de su casita a poder jugar y buscarme a mí para poder estar conmigo. Así, pero cuando se hace de noche, Poli sabe de que debe de irse a su casita. Así de que comienza a correr, volar, gritar, etc. Entonces nos está diciendo que todas las mañanas, uh, every morning, uh, the perro, you know, has the chance to go out of his little house cage and play around the house. But at night, uh, he refuses to go back in. And that's what the uh, composition is about. Okay, lovely. Let's hear it. Oh, right, there it goes out. away now. Yes. Uh, do you want to hear the whole thing? Maybe like... Uh, Maybe a little more. A little thing. more than what he played? <laughs> sure. Okay, uh, Valentin, toca un poco más de lo que tocaste en piano. Uh, de repente, la mitad de la canción o algo así. Okay. El lorito del piano. No, el lorito poli. Toca el lorito poli. Un poquito más, que dure un poco más. Eh, les cuento sobre la canción del lorito poli, ¿no? No, toca, toca. Ah, la toco. Valentin, I, th I think I think Polly liked it a lot too because Polly was really making a lot of noise. So, so thank you very much, Valentin. So, uh, Jesus, tell us uh, how was it when Valentin 
came. How did you get him as a student? How has he progressed? Valentin, muchas gracias. Muy bonito. Ya, yeah. eh, eh, si puedes eh, apagar tu micrófono. Uh, muchas gracias. Muy bonito. Nos gustó a todos. Eh, so Valentin, he uh, he is part of a violin ensemble called uh, Los Violines de San Juan, uh, based in San Juan de Miraflores. It's a vulnerable area of uh, Lima, Peru. And we have an ongoing uh, partnership with Los Violines de San Juan. We meet their students, we provide them some private lessons, group lessons, and they are one of uh, our the programs that we work with. And when you say uh, a vulnerable area, what do you mean? What does that mean, a vulnerable area? Uh, means that uh, San Juan de Miraflores, uh, it's an area of Lima where there is a lot of crime, uh, where a lot of the population don't have uh, basic necessities such as uh, running water, uh, roads. Of course, not all the students are in the same position, but I remember uh, visiting, visiting them uh, a few years ago, there was a student that had to walk to rehearsal about an hour and a half uh, because there is no uh, public transportation in some areas of San Juan de Miraflores. It's a very big area of Lima. So tell us uh, when, so Valentin's then his teachers, they contacted you and they said, we have a student and uh, he, Valentin wanted to do composition as well as violin, as well as piano. How, how did that work? Did, did you say, no, that's too much for you to do? Or you said, okay, that's great. Uh, no, I mean, first we started with violin because that's, that was what we were doing with this program. Just give violin lessons. Uh, but at some point, uh, his father uh, told us, Valentin also plays piano. And then he sent us a video of him playing piano and we were very impressed by it. And especially since he's so young, and he can play very well, both instruments. And that's how he joined our piano uh, classes. And then we uh, started a composition uh, workshop or a composition class. And we, we made it open for anyone who wanted to participate. And Valentin got really involved in the class with Professor Fabricio Cabero. Uh, he started composing since then. Fantastic, wonderful. So let's go on to our next guest, our next uh, student of Musicians for the World, Zamariah Jones Blackman. Here is a video. So very nice. Thank Bravo. you. Tell us a little bit, how did you get uh, involved with the cello? So when I was around four years old, 
my sister started playing the violin and my parents decided since yeah, since she's playing the violin I should also play the violin to save money to get to use the used violins that she used. But when I saw the cello I decided I am going to play the cello. So and here I am today. Wonderful. So then uh how long have you been playing the cello then? I've been playing the cello for nine years. Fantastic. Well, and tell us, how did you get involved then with Musicians for the World? Well, Musicians for the World well, partnered with my orchestra, Trinidad and Tobago Youth Philharmonic, and my teacher called and said I should join, and here I am. Fantastic. And tell us about learning this Bach cello suite. It's uh, very challenging. What, what has been most difficult for you? I think about along the last part, right, and in, also in the beginning, getting the coordination between the strings, cross, string crossing. I, think, I thought that was the most difficult, but it's a great song, but it's not very easy to play. But once you learn it, it's an interesting experience. Well, bravo, fantastic. Thank you very much, Samaria. So we have another question from Professor Lino Rivera. Lino? Yes, uh, and this question is for Kelly and Jesus again. Um, how many teachers do you have involved in this organization? Because I cannot imagine just the two of you teaching all of these uh, students. How many are you and who is organizing all of this? This is a lot of administrative effort. Yeah, so actually um, up until about a week ago, me and Jesus were the only two violin teachers. Um, we have two cello teacher, three cello teachers, um, two piano teachers, one composition teacher. Um, we have a clarinet teacher, yeah. a flute teacher, yeah. viola teacher, um, and we have three double bass teachers. Um, but you know, all of these people have been slowly getting added on. So for a while, it was just us. Um, it's a lot of work but uh, the students, you know, they, they enjoy it so much and they are so willing to learn that it doesn't really feel like work. So um, we are doing a, a, a big amount of the teaching. Um, we also, Jesus and I do all of the coordinating, all of the WhatsApp groups, everything, doing all the concerts. Um, but yeah, it's all we're doing. So it's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, and, and just a follow up, I mean, of course, this is what you do uh, on the financial and the business side of it. How, who is paying you? I mean, you have to make a living. You have to put food on the table. And if you are not charging anything for teaching all of the students, who's putting the food on the table? So um, we've been applying for grants, but it, they say that it takes about three years for a nonprofit to start profiting um so we've everything up till now has been 100 percent voluntary um we do have some private students and we do uh play in weddings and everything um but we haven't no money has uh, come in yet from this it's all voluntary for the past year fantastic wow so Let's talk a little bit now about Zamraya. Tell us about uh, when, when you first heard Zamraya and tell us about his progress. Hey, Zeus, sorry. And Kelly, if you could. Oh, I thought you were asking him. I'm sorry. His progress. Well, uh, Zamraya, we were very impressed the first time we heard him play, especially uh, because I never met a, a young cellist from this area of the world, from Trinidad and Tobago. And Semeraya, Semaya, sorry, has been able to play for Brand Taylor, who is the one of the main cellists of the Chicago Symphony. And he has also played for Ilmari Hopkins in one of our master classes, who is the principal cellist of the Stavanger Orchestra in Norway. So uh, 
really he's made a lot of progress and how do you see uh, obviously he's becoming more advanced every day how do you see working with him in the future will he have to um, continue the virtual lessons will that become an ob obstacle or how do you see the future his his educational future well um i mean we don't have other choice but just do a virtual education we one of our goals is to also make sure that um, their teachers are benefiting from our program so that the overall level in their own community improves. Uh, so actually, Semaya's teacher has been part of our big master classes. She has been able to play for great artists. Uh, and yeah, uh, there is few cases here and there where we want to try to uh, get them scholarships in in Europe, the US. Uh, that's a long term goal, but uh, that's for now. That's the best we've been doing. Okay, yeah. Zamaria, and tell us. Uh, so you're taking lessons from your teacher there in Port of Spain, and at the same time, you're also taking the online lessons. Is that right? Actually, the lesson that I'm getting with my teacher is also online because right now the country is on lockdown, so we can't really go anywhere. But yes, that is true. Understood. And it must be difficult for you when you can't be there with the teacher and the teacher can show you how to hold the bow, how to move your fingers. You have to kind of figure out a lot on your own. Is that right? Yes, sir. And what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you during this pandemic? The biggest challenge for me was maybe getting to class on time. Sometimes maybe I forget to have the class and at that certain time, or maybe because of the time difference, and maybe I, sometimes I feel sleepy and not really want to go to class. So that is just mainly the biggest challenge. And the time difference, so you mean uh, the difference between New York City and Port of Spain? Yes, sir. it's about an hour. So sometimes, like, when I think it's, like, let's say I have something 12 o'clock in Trinidad time, it might start 1 o'clock in New York. Okay, well... That's uh, it's um, impressive now that because uh, I bet a lot of people they don't know about all of these time zones and you've got a very good idea of what time it is in New York City already. So fantastic. Thank you so much, Samira. No Thank problem. you for the lovely playing. Thanks for thanks for the uh, very, very nice conversation. Let's now go on to Harold Suarez from Chiquitos, Bolivia. He's a violin student, and here is a video of him.
wonderful. So we have, before I bring in Harold, another question, comment from Lino Rivera. Lino? Yes. It, you know, um, Jesus and Kelly, uh, I grew up in the, on a farm village in the Philippines. And the, uh, the rooster crowing right there just reminds me of my childhood when I was practicing piano. And oh, that's the background noise, the, the roosters right there and the ducks and the, and the geese, uh, because I grew up on a farm. Um, what my question then for is, it needs a great support from the family. I would not be a pianist right now if not for the support of my parents and my family. How do you involve the parents, especially uh, for those um, kids who are in those um, um, areas that are poor areas, how do you instill in the parents? Because that's really the foundation there, for the, the value of music uh, for their kids. Otherwise, this is not going to happen. So, so I'm just curious. Yes, yeah, so, so we have to... Uh, it's important to know that between us and the students, uh, there is their local program. You know, so most of these issues about regarding parents and parents' involve, involvement is already taken care of through these uh, local programs. For example, Juarez uh, belongs to the uh, Orquesta Misional de Santiago de Chiquitos. But there have been few instances where we have to be more involved with the parents uh, because we, we do notice some situations. For example, there is a student from San Juan de Miraflores who works uh, doing like embroidery work uh, with his uncle and he works like all day and he doesn't have time to practice and he's so talented so once we contact his father send him a letter saying that his uh, son has great potential and and that he if he should have a little bit more time <laughs> for practicing because we think that he could actually make a future uh, with it. But uh, most of the parenting relationship is taken care of through their local programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Harold, tell us a little bit about this music you played. I've been told that this is native Baroque music of, of uh, Bolivia. Is, is that the case? Dice que, Harold, que nos cuentes un poco sobre la pieza que estás tocando. Dice que ha escuchado que es música barroca eh, boliviana. Si nos puedes decir un poco más sobre la pieza. Sí, eh, la pieza es la sonata número 18 de, de los archivos de las misiones jesuíticas de, de Bolivia. Y es el andante, de, el segundo movimiento, el andante de la sonata, de una selección de sonatas de, de 19 sonatas que tienen los archivos de Chiquito. Oh, ok, le voy a eh, traducir. So, in Chiquitos there is an archive of uh, music written uh, during the Jesuit missions. Uh, I think, I believe it's during the 18th century or something like that. Uh, the students have access to these uh, archives and they play their own music, Baroque music, and this is the sonata number 18 from an anonymous composer. Fantastic. Um, and sí. Harold, uh, tell us uh, a little bit, uh, how is the pandemic situation there where you are in Bolivia? Que nos cuentes sobre la situación de la pandemia en Bolivia, or donde estás tú? Eh, la pandemia ha azotado bastante fuerte a, a cuestión de la música, más que todo el arte. Entonces, las escuelas de música por estos lados han estado sobreviviendo y oh, recientemente han empezado otra vez a trabajar a las modalidades de antes. Entonces, como que la, la pandemia ha azotado mucho el, el, el sector más que todo eh, artístico eh, en esta zona. He said that pandemic has hit uh, artists and the whole art sector in that area. And they didn't have activities uh, for a long time. They recently resumed their activities, their musical activities. Okay. Thank you so much, Harold, for your lovely playing. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. 
and for introducing us to some new Bolivian music. So, so let's have, uh, now we're going to see Adrian Atonia of the Kenyan National Youth Orchestra, Marilan Villegas of Los Violines de San Juan, Catherine Wai Rimu of the Kenyan National Youth Philharmonic Orchestra, and uh, Zamaria Jones Blackman again of the Trinidad and Tobago Youth Orchestra, and John Musila also of the Kenyan National Youth Orchestra. Here is a video of them playing The Swan by Saint Sons, all virtually. Fantastic. So uh, let's have Adrian Atonia talk first about this. Hi, Adrian. Hi. So, Adrian, tell us a little bit about uh, where, you, first of all, where are you calling us from? Where are you joining us from? Um, calling from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And tell us how uh, how did you get involved with musicians for the world? Pardon? How did you get involved with musicians for the world? Oh, there was a friend of mine from the orchestra, a double bass player called Belvin, who actually told us about some master classes. Um, so we joined and later on we're told that um, they're going to have a class for us, Kenyan violinists, and I I'm sorry, I think we've lost Adrian right now. Why don't we continue? Why don't we go to uh, Marlon? Marlon Villegas. Hi Marlon. Hola Marlon. 
Hola a todos, hola. So, Marlon, tell us, what, where are you calling us from? Where are you joining us from? Desde, dice que le digan, ¿desde dónde estás llamando? Ah, estoy este, en San Juan de Miraflores, Lima, Perú. Okay, so you're uh, so you're also in the same uh, the same area as Valentin Ilaras. Tell us, uh, how did you get into the violin? ¿Cómo eh, aprendiste a tocar el violín? Aprendí en la en el elenco de los violines de San Juan cuando tenía 13 años. He, he became part of uh, this violin ensemble called Los Violines de San Juan when he was 13 years old. Fantastic. And tell us what, um, how, how has it been? What has your experience been working with musicians for the world? ¿Cuál ha sido tu experiencia eh, con musicians for the world? Las clases maestras. Tenía, tuve como tres clases maestras con excelentes violinistas. He, he uh, has participated in different master classes and some of them uh, are, have been with excellent uh, musicians. I, I want to uh, uh, mention that Marlon uh, was able to play for Andrei Baranov. Andrei Baranov is the former winner of the Queen Elizabeth violin competition. Wow, fantastic. And Marlon, tell us, um, what have you learned in particular? What has, because um, you, you play violin very well, what um, what have the lessons or this master class taught you? Dice que qué has aprendido eh, durante las más las clases maestras con musicians for the world. La, eh, una, unas técnicas, este, los cambios de posiciones, las afinaciones. <laughs> It's the new techniques, how to do uh, shifting properly, uh, he improve his intonation. Fantastic, wonderful. Thank you, Marlon. So, uh, hello uh, to Catherine Wairimu. Hello, hi. Hi, Catherine. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you started playing the cello. Oh, wow. Um, so I started playing the cello um, halfway through campus. I fell in love with the cello, though, when I was young. I saw it in a movie, <laughs> but I didn't manage to access one until much later. So, yeah. So you, you watched a movie. It was a Hollywood movie, somebody playing a cello? It, yeah, I just, there was a lady playing a cello and she was being accompanied by a piano. And then I didn't even know what it was back then. So I just, I was so impressed and I fell in love with it. But um, I couldn't access one until when I was in campus. And tell us how, how what has your experience been working with musicians for the world? Oh, wow. It's been amazing. Um, I've learned so much. They've helped me. Um, okay, so first of all, I've been in between uh, lessons, being self-taught and ac acquiring actual cello lessons, then back. <laughs> so it's been back and forth. So being able to learn from musicians from the world, from actually um, high quality music lessons, from high level cellists has been incredible. So it's really fixed my technique and my intonation. I've learned a lot, to say. Fantastic. And yeah. tell us, how has the situation, the pandemic situation, been there in Nairobi? Um, so we are on and off lockdown. So um, there was one time after a year, so last year, towards the end of last year, they gave us a go ahead to have a concert. And then so we had a rehearsal. We finally had our orchestra rehearsal and then just before the concert, we went back to lockdown. So it's been on and off, um, not much happening. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your lovely playing and it's so nice to speak with you. Thank you. So John Musilla, hello. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Tell us, so tell us a little bit about making this recording, John. First of all, I would like to thank you for having me here and providing us with this platform where we can really learn a lot about music. 
um about the recording uh, it was actually quite uh, a pleasant learning experience because uh, for example for the pianist uh, the accompanist that is um I was, uh, while making the recording, I was supposed to, I did this actually, I imagined the voice, uh, which is the violin, the main, the soloist in the music, I, I had to imagine them playing with a different rubato because it's romantic music, rubato playing and uh, the phrasing and everything, the dynamics, I had to hear all that in my head while I was recording the piano part. And I also had to, to 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 put into perspective the fact that they won't necessarily follow the phrasing that I imagine because they're different human beings. So yeah, it's so it's actually it was a good opportunity to learn to adapt to the new way of uh, sharing music. And yeah, I'm really grateful for that. Lovely. Well, you did an excellent job. Do you think you will accompany singers in the future? uh yeah i think it's 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 something that uh i've i've been doing in the past before the pandemic that is i've only done music for about five or six years but it's something i enjoy doing playing with other musicians yeah and i think it's something that's beautiful wonderful fantastic thank you so much uh and lino rivera has another question or comment lino yes uh John, it is really very challenging. And what you just said is so true because I am experiencing that myself. I have to record the foundation for the choir or for other uh, musicians and imagining them singing it. And it's just so true, exactly the way you describe it. It's a very challenging uh, endeavor. Now, my question is for Kelly and Jesus again. When we get out of this pandemic, what is the plan for uh, for your project when we are getting out of the internet and it, resuming the live interaction between musicians? What, what's the plan? Uh, so our plan is to continue the online lessons because they have proven to be very effective and it's a good way to give access to people across the world to a program like this. But um we haven't really like told our students yet but we have been planning um trips in 2022 to go see some of them and create sort of like a festival um i don't know if you want to speak about that yes we are planning our first uh international uh, musician for the world festival in in lima peru where musicians for the world t-shirts go to peru perform in vulnerable areas where the students are from and the students get to have uh, online, uh, I'm sorry, in-person classes with them. Uh, the idea is to do this in a different country every year. And if at some point, if we ever have like enough budget to maybe take students from, you know, from Kenya to Peru or from Peru to Belize or do like an international exchange, that would be like, uh, like kind of like a dream. Yeah. Fantastic. So uh, I'd just like to try again, Adrian, Atonia. Adrian, are you still there? We got cut off the last yes, time. Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. So uh, tell us uh, now, tell us about studying the violin in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, actually, I started the vi studying the violin when I was 15, when I was in high school, because I took music as a subject and um, we had to choose instruments and personally i i had never changed my mind to, i've never thought about doing any other instrument other than the violin so when i was young i had never i'm sorry i think we lost adrian again i'm so very sorry um so we are going adrian are you back no, do you want us to talk a tiny, like for 30 seconds about Adrian, just so we get yes, a chance? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. So um, Adrian is one of our most talented students. The first time we heard him play, our jaws dropped. Um, he won't say it, but he's an incredible violinist. Um, and the fact that he started when he's 15 is just like beyond anything I could imagine. Um, and 
So Adrian was one of the students where we heard and we're like, oh my gosh, there are incredible musicians around the world. So um, Adrian is a really big inspiration for us. Um, he played uh, in our masterclass series with Anton Polajev, who is a former member of the New York Philharmonic. And he was so impressed that he actually joined our staff to teach Adrian. Um, so each week he's been having lessons with uh, someone who was in the New York Phil. And um, yeah, Adrian is like one of our- Competition. Oh, and he um, actually, he entered a international competition through us and um, won. So he's been doing really amazing things. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we're really proud yeah. of Adrian. Um, so we have, uh, we're about to run out of time. I don't know if um, I should run another video or if you two, you've promised me that uh, there would be a little bit of music that the teachers would show us how it's done. What would you prefer? Um, it's up to all of you who are, who are here. Um, if you'd rather, so today is Peru's 200th year of independence. So we created a video with some of our Peruvian students playing uh, El Condor Paso. Yeah. Um, so we could either do that or me and Jesus could play. Let's take a look at it. We can do both. Yeah, okay. I think I think probably. Yeah. Great, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, Jesus, tell us uh, 200 years of independence in Peru. Yes, it's a very important uh, date. It's a date we've been looking forward uh, for many years. And there is uh, a lot of celebrations. Actually, uh, Kelly and I are going to Patterson, New Jersey, after the interview where there is the biggest uh, colony of uh, Peruvian uh, Peruvians outside of Peru. Fantastic. Wonderful. And tell us now, what is in the future for Musicians for the World? You said that you're going to uh, have some live festivals. What, uh, what's it look like to you two? Yes, I mean, that's the idea to have, uh, I mean, of course, the online aspect is going to be the, the basis of the program. Uh, the core of the program, but we want to incorporate uh, some live uh, performances, teaching uh, in different countries. Uh, and of course, ideally, we want to reach out to as many uh, communities around the world as possible. So we are just going to be expanding. Uh, today is nine countries. Who knows? In two years, it will be 20 countries and, and keep going. Fantastic. Would you two be willing to play for us a little bit of uh, violin? Can we hear how the pros do it? Sure. Huh? 
All right, let us just start this up. Okay, so we're performing for you uh, Salsa composed by a Russian, uh, by a Russian composer. It's called Salsa de la Luna by Alexei uh, Igudesma. Bravi teachers, fantastic, wonderful. Thank you so much. So we see uh, what's in store for these young students, learning from the people who know how to do it the best, fantastic. So we look forward to very bright futures for all these young people and look forward to following musicians for the world and your inevitable success. Thank you so, so much for having us, this was really great. And it was nice to meet all of you. Uh, Lino, thank you for all your great questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lino. You, you all can contact us at any moment, anytime. <laughs> so let's take a look at how we can stay in touch with Musicians for the World. There's our website, musiciansfortheworld.org. I will copy it in a second. So all we have to do here is go over to contact. And then is that how they can contact you directly, Kelly and Jesus? Yes, you can either contact us through this contact page. If you happen to be on our Instagram or our Facebook or any social media, we answer anywhere that anyone reaches out. So, Fantastic. Wonderful. So I will put that right now in the chat box. So that's musiciansfortheworld.org. There it is. So again, thank you very much to Kelly and to Jesus and to all of their students. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We have um, all of our students okay. did such a good job. Now let's take a look at next Wednesday. We have Ming Huan Chu and Winston Choi duo diorama. There are assumably a lot of violin and piano duos around, but how many of them are married? Furthermore, how many are respectively heads of the strings and piano departments? at one of Chicago's most prestigious music conservatories? Come welcome Ming Huan and Winston to our show and get ready for a dynamic duo, the likes of which you have never heard before. As always, all information about upcoming shows is available at www 
www.simeonmoro.com. Again, that's Ming Huan Shu and Winston Choi, Duo Diorama. So once again, thank you very much to Kelly McGarry. Thank you to Jesus Sainz, to Valentin Ilares, Carol Suarez, Adrian Atonia, Marlon Biegas, Catherine Wairimu, Zamira Jones Blackman, and John Musila. Thank you to Professor Lino Rivera. And most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From Vienna, Austria, New York City, Lima, Peru, Chiquitos, Bolivia, and uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, and San Francisco, California. Goodbye, and see you next Wednesday. Bye, Thank man. you.